you. Yes, it's my birthday when I was asked to do this. I said, well, shit, that's my birthday. And I thought, that's perfect. I'm going to do it on my birthday. So thank you for coming. And um, this, is a, this is a cool experience for me because, um, you know, I never get to talk to people who've been drinking. <laughs> I'm usually the one that's drank before the talk. But. So, um, so this is nice. And thank you to the Leaky Foundation and um, Ariel Johnson and um, everybody for coming. All right, so I'm going to talk today about, about laughter. And I got into studying laughter originally um, as a grad student. I did my dissertation actually on what kinds of um, vocal signals people use to communicate when they're being sarcastic. And, and that started my, I would say, an arguably absurd academic career studying weird shit. And, um, and I discovered a lot of things um, in, um, about how people um, speak when they're being ironic, but one thing I noticed was that people laugh a lot. And then later in my career, I really took off with it. Now I've got more projects than I can count on laughter, and so I'm gonna describe a few of them. But I'm very interested in cross-cultural research, and I'm very interested in how evolutionary theory allows us to understand human vocalizations, um, which goes beyond a lot of the, the ways that traditional psychologists and linguists often think about vocal communication. Um, I think that, that um, we're animals. Now, I know we're animals, actually. I don't just think we're animals. So here's an example I put together of um, the different, vocaliz um, different facial expressions of, of threat displays, right, that are, that are originating from a, f a motion of fear. And you can see that, that uh, these different animals are doing the same kind of thing. They're all kind of baring their teeth, right? And there is a, what we call a phylogenetic relationship between all these animals. Evolution is conservative, meaning that, not politically, it means that evolution conserves structure. So it doesn't rebuild things very often. It always builds on things that already exist. And so if you look at expressions across the animal kingdom, you um, see a lot of similarities, and it's not a coincidence. So now I'm going to play a vocalization, um, an animal vocalization, and see what you think. If I can get it to work. What the hell was that? Walruses? Huh? A bear? It wasn't one of, it wasn't one of these animals. A whale, bear, walrus? I like walrus myself. Well, actually, uh, it's slowed down. Let me play it for you at normal speed. <laughs> <laughs> Those are 19-year-old females from UC Santa Cruz laughing. <laughs> Not walruses. I added the ocean thing. Because I'm tricky that way. I've been interested in slowing down animal sounds a long time, well before I became a scientist. Um, I, it's partially due to my brother, who's back here. He gave me my first four-track. Raise your hand. My brother, there he is, look at that. <laughs> he lives in San Francisco, he didn't come far. <laughs> so I got this four track when I was, you know, in my early 20s, you know, like a few years ago. And um, it had a, a way to control the, the, what the, it was a pitch control, it was called pitch control, it just controlled the speed, right? And I was fascinated with this thing. And I mean, I'm a musician, I'm interested in making experimental sounds, I also play regular instruments, but I'm really into weird sounds, I'm into sounds. And so the, the, one of the best features of this four track was I could slow stuff down, and I was just fascinated with this. And so I, um, in those days, you had to, um, you couldn't get stuff off the internet because there was no internet you had to actually buy sound effect CDs or records. I literally have sound effect LPs. And then I would feed them into this four track and then I would, I would mess with the sounds. And I was just fascinated with this idea of how animal sounds and human sounds slowed down, sounded so different. And I noticed even then um, that 
when you slow down a, um, a cry or a laugh or a scream or something that was emotional and visceral the way I thought about it then, it sounded like an animal. It sounded like a non-human animal. But when you slow down somebody talking, which I also would try, obviously, it did not sound like an animal. It sounded like a person slowed down. And I just always thought this was really interesting, and I didn't understand why. And so I eventually came around to figuring out why. And I'm going to explain that now. So that was a slowed down, um, slowed down people laughing. But, I mean, how many people thought it was actually human slowed down? Anybody get that? Smarty pants. Oh, oh, you, you got it, smart guy in the back, my brother. So most people don't get that. I actually have experimental evidence showing that people cannot tell um, whether a slowed down spontaneous laugh is a human or non-human animal unless it's produced in a fake way. And so I'm going to explain a little bit of that, what a, the difference between a fake laugh and a real laugh and what that actually means. All right, so let's just start with the basic question, the most unfunny part of what a laugh is, which is it's a neuromechanical oscillation involving respiratory and laryngeal activity. That's my definition of a laugh. It is a involuntary vocalization that is evolutionarily related to vocalizations that many other animals produce. And that's what makes it so, such an interesting vocalization for me to study as a person who's interested in evolution and human communication. It's really, a, just, I mean, one of the most perfect vocalizations, along with crying, which I'm eventually going to get to, but I have not studied crying. Um, and pain shrieks are another one. And one of my favorite topics, one that got me on this laughter kick in the first place, was um, orgasms. I'll talk about that in a minute. Turns out laughs and orgasms share a lot of properties and they're very related. Not a surprise maybe to some of you. All right, so let's just look at, this is a laugh. This is a spectrogram of a laugh, meaning that you have a, a representation of the acoustics here. Up here is just the overall amplitude. This is the same laugh, but represented two ways. Overall amplitude here, which is just collapsing all the frequencies into um, one representation. So th the bigger the, the thing is, the louder it is. Um, and then down here is basically breaking it up into, um, across the frequency spectrum, you can see where the darker areas mean there's more energy at those frequencies, and lighter areas means there's less energy. This line here represents the amplitude curve, which correlates exactly to this. So this line is basically just showing this again. These black lines are what's called the fundamental frequency, which correlates to our perceptions of pitch. So when I say, ha, 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 then you hear the pitch of my voice, and that's because I have vocal folds in my larynx that are vibrating at a certain rate, which correlates to a perception in your mind. Um, they're not perfectly related, but they're very closely related. And uh, what you see is, well, let me just play it for you. <laughs> Not a funny laugh, but that's a real standard kind of laugh. And you can see that laughs have these certain characteristics, like um, they have usually an initial onset that's louder than the rest, and there's a slight decay in the volume. Um, and then you have these, these calls where basically uh, the, there's a glottal cycle, meaning that the glottis, which is the in your larynx, that opens and closes. When it closes, the air gets forced through and then vibrates. That makes the, this, that the tone. And when it opens, then just air goes through and then you don't hear that as a tone. So when the glottis closes, then you actually get this fundamental frequency which correlates to a pitch. And then it opens and, and so basically a laugh is this rapid, um, opening and closing of the glottis. And it is involuntary and hard to do on purpose. And so when you try to laugh, um, you know, what I would say volitionally, when you try to laugh on purpose, it's hard to actually get it right. Now, some people can, and I'm going to show you data about that. Now, but laughing is very um, um, variable in how it comes across. So there are lots of different kinds of laughs. So let me just play you. These are all laughs I've recorded in the lab. Let me just play you a little collection of them. <laughs> oh. That's my favorite. <laughs> Am I sure they're genuine laughs? I'm sure they're laughs, 
But what 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 vocal system produced them, which I'm going to explain in a minute, I don't know for sure. But most of those are probably fairly real. But some of them are fake. Yeah. All right. So th th there's a lot of variation in how laughs actually manifest themselves, which makes them difficult to study. But they're really it's kind of paradoxical and interesting. We all know when we hear a laugh. Even though they can manifest themselves in all these different ways acoustically, we all know it when somebody laughs. But if I take them out of context, then they're really a little harder to tell if they're a laugh because they sound like the one, which I actually should have played that one by itself, but it's not on the thing. Um, it's, I call it squeaker laugh because it's like <coughs> And when you hear it in context, it totally sounds like a laugh. But out of context, it just sounds like a weird noise. All right. so. That's a standard laugh, and, and I'm going to show you some more of these spectrograms in a minute, um, like right here. So laughter is related to vocalizations that other animals make. Now, this is a, what we call phylogeny, which is just mean, as it means an evolutionary history of laughs across different species. So let me just play a few. Um, this was done by my, um, my friend um, Marina de Villaros, um, the late Michael Overin, and Elke Zimmerman. What they did is they looked at the acoustic features of laughs across different primate species, and then they tried to reconstruct the phylogeny of the vocal behavior in primates. Now, it turns out many animals laugh. And the laughs, I mean, we call them laughs, and that's probably an anthropomorphic way of describing them. But with what they are, they're play vocalizations. So they are vocalizations that animals produce when they are usually juveniles when they're when they're doing rough and tumble play, and it's a way of telling the other animal, "I'm not threatening you now. I am playing." And they're usually quiet in most species, and which is why they're really hard to record. And now we're going to have wireless mics that attach to fur. I can't wait for this. And then we can because I think actually all social animals produce some some analog of this kind of vocalization, and it's just a matter of getting them. But we know rats do them, so rats produce ultrasonic um, play vocalizations, and they sound kind of like laughs when you bring them down into our frequency range. We can't hear them because they're at like 40 kilohertz, which is well beyond our hearing. But they produce these, and you can tickle rats, and they love it. And when they play, Google it. Put it in your notes right now. Google rafts laughing. It'll come up. Jack Panksepp, he has an aquarium with or well, not an aquarium, a terrarium with rats, and he's tickling, yeah, they're drowning in the aquarium. Now, they are in the terrarium, and he's tickling them, and they follow his hand around, and they're laughing up a storm. And then when they play with each other, they're laughing too, but you have to have a special recorder, one that's designed to record bat vocalizations, in order to hear them. And then you bring them down into our hearing range, and then they, it, you know, kick, 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 that's what they sound like. Um, so rats do this, dogs do it. Um, but dogs also do something else that's similar to laugh. So what a dog wants to play, what do they do? Huh? They wag. How about play bow? It's called a play bow. And that is a signal a dog makes to another dog saying, I'm now going to attack you, but I don't mean it. <laughs> and, you know, it often doesn't end well because there's, it's not clear how the signal turns off. Right? So it's not like, we're playing now, I'm biting and attacking you, which normally would seem aggressive, but we're playing, and then you, know, you go a little too far. Which is kind of the way kids are, right? Kids are playing, they're laughing, and then suddenly somebody's crying. <laughs> right? So laughter is a play vocalization, and I think is functionally very similar to a play bow in a dog. It allows us to play, and that doesn't mean it isn't going to hurt, but it does mean that you're not being um, threatening and aggressive in the way you might otherwise seem to be if you didn't have that behavior. That's one function of laughter. Let's listen to some of these. Here is the um, orangutan. <laughs> Here is, I think, the gorilla. <laughs> you hear the similarity? Mm -hmm. Now, chimps are an interesting thing. They do something um, unique, which is they do um, not just egressive, meaning outward, but they go in and out. <laughs> 
Right. And the idea here is that laughter is basically labored breathing during play. This is um, Robert Provine, who has written about laughter quite a bit that maybe some of you are familiar with. And, and what he has um, claimed is that he, he calls this labored breathing during play. So it originally, this is what animals would do when they're playing, and then, um, which is a phenomena in animal signaling where signals become what we call ritualized, meaning that originally they're produced for some non-communicative reason, and then they become communicative and then take on exaggerated features that facilitate that of evolutionary function. So this is a fairly well understood and well described process in animal signal research and this is what's happening with laughter. So it's becoming an exaggerated version of this labored breathing during play. Um, finally, here's some human laughs to compare. <laughs> That's one of my favorite laughs of all time, just tell you right now. I'm going to play that one again in some different ways. I slow it down and it sounds awesome. Um, but here's another one that I think really get, brings out the connection between these non-human laughs and human laughs. <laughs> right? I mean, you can hear how that's a laugh, right? But it's, it, it also makes it kind of obvious that there's, you know, it connects to these other vocalizations. So these guys, based on this acoustic data, they reconstructed the, the evolutionary history of laughter um, and also, you know, being mindful of what we know about the genetic relationship between different primate species, um, and particularly the great apes. And so you can see that the, the last common ancestor had what they think are these certain features, which are long, slow calls, and they're noisy. So it was probably the first laughs in primates was something like, <sighs> Something like that, you know, and that's, they're breathing, they're probably breathing while they're playing. Um, but then eventually you have things like vibration regimes, which means there's tones, and then chimps involved this alternating airflow, which makes them different. And we have more regular voicing, which is important, and aggressive airflow. And then um, this is also by Marina Del Villa Ross, but I added my little thing here, which is when speech emerges, we have volitional laughter, which is where the fake laughs come in, which this chart doesn't represent until I put that little part in there. <laughs> she knows, it's cool. All right, so let's do a little test. See if you guys can tell what a real laugh or a fake laugh. First one. <laughs> real laugh? You guys are smart. <laughs> I make it easy at first. <laughs> Actually, there's a reason why it's so easy. It's because we have evolved machinery. It's designed to detect these kinds of things. But it can get tricky. <laughs> Ooh. How many people think it's real? How many people think it's fake? Oh, geez, I'd say that's almost 50-50, maybe with a slight um, on the reel. That is a fake laugh. Pretty good, though. Yep, that could be your friend. <laughs> that is actually maybe one of the best fake laughs. And in my research, um, I've got research from um, all over the world, and that one is rated as real by people almost like 80% of the time. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> real? Yeah. Fake. Yeah. Ah, yeah. I th I, I would call that one real. I mean, that's what people think. Now, mind you, I, don't, I didn't have um, wires hooked up to their larynx or anything on their brain to actually corroborate uh, just what people think, that they're real. And it was produced by a woman speaking to a, her close friend in a conversation. So that's good evidence that it's, pr it's probably more likely to be real. <laughs> All right, last one. See what you can do here. <laughs> That's fake? How many people think that one's real? All right, compare it to this one. <laughs> That's super fake, right? A <laughs> little better? Still fake. Okay. That is fake, but what I did is I sped it up, and it turns out if you speed up fake laughs, you make them sound real. 
And I have an explanation for that. It has to do with the control of the glottis. The opening and closing of the glottis is in control by one brain circuit, and it's got an evolved, efficient control over it. When we're speaking, it's harder to control that opening and closing on purpose. So even though you guys weren't tricked because you're smarty, many of my subjects were tricked. All right, so you guys see this is actually not that hard to do. Um, now, here's just an example of looking at the fake versus um, real laugh. This is the spectrograms of them. One thing you'll notice is that um, the spontaneous or real laughs are faster generally. And so this one's slower. This one's a little faster. You can see it by how long these little bursts are. Um, oh, this is a slow down version. Sorry. So you can see it here. So this is the regular laugh. You can see it's pretty fast. And then this one's a little slower. So let's play this one real quick here. Um, here's the laugh that we heard. <laughs> now, if I speed it up, you already heard that. It sounds a little more real, even though you guys didn't believe it. But now, check it out when I slow it down. <laughs> that still sounds like a person, right? That doesn't sound like a walrus or a bear or whatever. Now, listen to this laugh, my favorite laugh. <laughs> now, check it out when I slow this one down. <laughs> That doesn't sound like a person so much anymore, do you think? Sounds like an animal. Um, so I've got uh, research showing that when you play um, spontaneous laughs, and those are laughs that are produced in conversations between people that know each other, those laughs are more likely, when you slow them down 2.6 times, slow those down and people are at chance at deciding whether or not they're produced by a human or a non-human animal. But when you play them the volitional laughs, the fake ones, then they are 65% accurate in identifying it as a human. And so what that suggests to me is that there are features in those acoustic laughs that are really brought out by that slowing down process that then reveal it as an, an animal vocalization that really shares properties with other non-human animal vocalizations, as opposed to the speech, which is a very human-specific vocalization that has unique characteristics that help us identify it as being produced by a person. Um, now, one thing I've discovered is that if you look at the, um, the voicing, the ratio of how much voicing versus how much is unvoiced here, where, where there's no tone, the, the, more, um, the, the higher percentage of unvoiced components per call correlates with people's judgments of whether something is real or not. And I think this is a direct consequence of the, the machinery underlying the production of these different kinds of laughs. So spontaneous laughs are involuntarily produced, and they involve certain sorts of, of uh, breathing mechanisms that are really difficult to control on purpose. And so laughs that are produced by the speech system are more speechy, meaning that they have a higher proportion of voicing, vowel sounds. Right, ha, 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 the ultimate fake laugh, right? There's no breathing in there, it's just all vowels, right? But if you start going, <laughs> you know, then it sounds a little more real, right? So that's your trick if you wanna make more real laughs, make them faster, make them higher pitched, like you're aroused, and try to make it so they're a little more breathy. <laughs> there it is. Now, the, the, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but there is actually, um, I didn't know this when I was 22 years old and slowing down chickens and seals and humans and shit. I didn't realize that um, what, I was getting on, what I was getting into. At the same time then, this guy Jurgens was working on squirrel monkey vocalizations and kind of figured out that there is some special circuitry that is unique to mammals that is different than humans. So you have a very simple um, sort of circuit here that this paraaqueductal gray region that goes um, right st straight from, it's basically amygdala to larynx. It's a direct connection. Whereas speech involves all these other connections that involve language and the control of speech articulators. So we have to control our tongue and our lips and um, other muscles in our neck and our larynx um, that allow us to make speech sounds. And when you incorporate those mechanisms, which actually allows us to imitate a great number of sounds, so humans are vocal imitators, um, it allows us to imitate things like crying and laughter and pain shrieks and orgasms and all these other things that can be fake, but there are ways to look at them acoustically and see the signature of human-specific production. 
So let's think about when people are laughing, what's going on? So imagine you have this guy here. He produces this utterance X. That's a surface feature, like what you actually say. But he means Y, which is the unstated implicit meaning. Right? This is sort of like a lot of jokes are like this. It's encryption. Right? So my friend Nicole, who's here somewhere, you know, might ask me, um, you got free drinks for doing this? And I said, they gave me two tickets. And then she goes, that's not enough. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. I'm just kidding. I'm sure they'll give me more if I ask. <laughs> and then we have a laugh. That's a humor circuit right there. But it's encrypted that two is not enough. <laughs> so that's funny to her, right? That's not funny maybe to this guy who doesn't know that um, I like to drink. And so two sounds like plenty, you know. But hey, I'm taking a cab home. And so he goes, <laughs> It sounds like you're trying to be funny, but that's, I don't get it. And then I, like, yeah, yeah. And then we have an awkward interaction, right? <laughs> humor is encryption. Humor, a lot of intentional humor involves Im me implying things that people know, but you don't say the thing that's funny. That's why explaining a joke ruins it. Because the funny thing is when you, you are able to signal, I know what you're saying, I know, I gotcha. Right? And a lot of things that we don't think of traditionally as humorous do elicit laughter. And it'll often, like, um, there's a classic example of um, this guy Provine who studied people um, in natural context and seeing when they laugh. And, he, and his whole thing is that it's not funny. It's not about humor. Because somebody would say, okay, I'll see you later. And then everybody goes, ha, 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 ha. But what Provine's not recognizing, and I've told him this and argued with him, and he, he probably agrees with me, is that you don't know why it's funny. The reason that, that I'll see you later is funny is because next time I'm going to see you, you will have gone through that hellish experience you were just describing to me, or whatever it might be. There's something else in there about seeing you later that's not just in the surface features of the utterance. So humor is encryption, and laughter can be a way to signal I get the encryption. I, can, I decrypted it successfully. And if I didn't decrypt it, then I'm faking it. All right, so... I looked at this real and fake laugh thing across 17, this is an ongoing study, we got three more, three more sites coming in, I think, we'll have 20. So um, in 20 different places in the world, we asked people to judge a set of laughs. Half were produced in context where people were having conversations with their friends that they knew, and half were produced on command, where we had them in the lab and we said, now laugh. And they would go, ha, 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 you know. Now, some people would produce some pretty good ones like you heard, right? So I didn't pick ones that were ridiculously bad. I picked ones that were made it a challenge, you know. But then we played these for people all over the world and seeing if they could tell the difference. And it turns out they can. So here are the results from these 17 societies. And basically, um, you, this bar here represents chance performance, right? So every single society is above chance overall. The average is about 64% accuracy in getting the right answer here. There's some interesting patterns. So for example, we have three traditional societies, a rural Peruvian society, the Shuar people in Ecuador, and uh, and Zulu people in South Africa, they're living in, in fairly traditional ways. They all had this pattern where they were more accurate at getting the answer when, when the correct answer was it's fake. And that's actually more accurate because a lot of the real laughs were probably fake. Like you were asking before, how do you know that's fake or real? I actually don't. I'm just using the context as, as my criterion, but it turns out that a lot of our real laughs in conversation are conversational laughs that are produced by the speech system, so in, in fake in that sense, right? Now, that doesn't mean that they're trying to deceive each other. Two friends it, it, it are la laughing in conversation. It's, it can have a lot of functions in conversation, like I get what you're saying, or it's your turn to talk, or, you know, I think that's funny, but it really didn't trigger a real humorous reaction in me, or whatever. But the answer is probably that, that, that more of these laughs were fake than real overall. And so I think it's interesting that these people, these traditional people are actually probably a little more accurate. Now other places are, are, have this bias to say that laughs are real. So Americans, for example, tend to think that laughs are more likely to be real just baseline on average, right? And so they end up being a little more accurate and getting the right answer on the real laughs. So um, this is a, uh, a, you know, a good, I think demonstration that no matter where you go in the world, people can hear laughs produced by UC Santa Cruz 18 year olds and decide whether or not they are real or fake with actually reasonable accuracy. All right, let's go back to our guys here and um, check out um, 
Another situation, so we have the same guy is uh, producing some sort of utterance, the surface feature, which denotes why, which is the implied meaning. And these guys all get it. All right, they're, on in, in, they're in on a joke, and then they all laugh. And then now we have a group of people laughing. Whereas this guy is like, I don't get it. And, and, but he knows something's funny. I know these guys have some idea of what this is, is about, but I don't know what it is. But I'll just pretend. And now he's laughing a little bit, right? Now, if you have a situation like, and then this guy laughs back. Now, this guy is an, over here. He wants to decide who here knows each other and knows the shared information that's encrypted and who doesn't. And you can use the laugh um, as a way to d decide who, who's friends and who's not in this group, who has the information, right? And then these kinds of inside jokes can actually really help a crowd figure out who knows who. Here's a good example of this from Breaking Bad. Benko? Sir, voy a trabajar sobre esos bastardos como caca pasando un pato, fíjate. Sí, verdad. Hank, what a tool. Right? And and this is where he really he realizes this is not the place for me. This makes me nervous. Besides seeing a um, human on a tortoise, whatever happened to him. That's an inside Breaking Bad joke. All right, so let's see how good you guys do. Friends or strangers? <laughs> <laughs> friends? How many people think strangers? How many people think friends? Wow, okay. I'll explain that in a minute. All right, let's try another one. <laughs> Friends? Now you guys are afraid. Strangers? Now I got you all confused. Those are friends. <laughs> Strangers? That's friends. Now here's what I did. I'm tricking you. The first one is actually I constructed. There, there were two individual laughs. People that didn't never interact. They were men, but that last one was the same laugh except it was produced by. I mean, I changed the pitch to make them sound like females. So check it out again. <laughs> That's men. Now I made them into women. <laughs> now, if this experiment works well, damn you. This is my first try. I have a new theory based on some other data I'm going to show you. That people think that women are more likely to be friends than men when they hear them laugh. Just at baseline. And I know that's true. I have got a lot of data showing that. But so what I'm trying to do is show if you think these two men, I need to get more subdued male laughs and then do it. But the men, um, you think we're friends, kind of, and then when you hear the same laughs, but then they sound like women, then you're going to think they're more likely to be friends, even though it's the same laugh. So I'm trying to separate the assumption that women are friends when they're laughing together versus the acoustic features of the laughs, which I'm very interested in. All right, let's try a couple more. <laughs> friends or strangers? Friends? Strangers. You guys, I got you all fucked up from that first one. They're friends. <laughs> stoner or not stoner? <laughs> Santa Cruz, baby. I actually am pretty sure they're stone. Based on the conversation, I'm just I'm serious. All right, so I I looked at this also across cultures, across twenty-four different cultures. Um and including several indigenous cultures. And just to see, I, these laughs averaged one second long, where they hear a one second clip of laughter, at, laughter out of context, and then they have to decide, are these people friends or strangers? And it turns out, and this is the places I, I did it, many of the same places I did it before. So LA, um, a couple Peruvian societies, 
um, Brazil, all the way down to we got, um, you know, um, we got Japan and Korea and China and um, I think the indigenous places here we got um, uh, here, here. Uh, there's a bunch. All right, and here's what happened here. So basically, everywhere you, we went, people were able to tell the difference between friends and strangers with varying accuracy. The lowest was something like 54%, and the highest was 67%. So there was some variation. And OK, I'll get you in a minute. Um, and, but one of the most striking um, findings here was that in every single place, women were, two females were thought, were judged m most accurately, including up here, the, the American participants were 90% accurate in getting the right answer. Whether they hear two female friends, they nailed it. They knew what they were. You had a question? No, 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 they all heard the same laugh set. Yes, thank you for clarifying that. They all heard 48 clips of two people laughing. Half of them knew each other and half of them didn't. They were all UC Santa Cruz students who were in conversations. So we had convers. thank you, I should have, I should have said this. Um, half the people were, um, had been friends for an average of about two years and then half the people had just met the day that they had this conversation and then the laughs were extracted from the conversations. The first time they had an overlapping laugh and the last time they had an overlapping laugh in the conversation. So these people all were co-laughing, they were laughing at the same time but they um, either knew each other or they didn't and then they were either in um, female pairs, male pairs or mixed pairs. Yeah, thank you for asking that, actually. So, um, so you, what you can see is that there's, there's, some very, th th there's some similar patterns, but there are some variations as well. Um, and so sometimes um, people were, were good at getting the uh, strangers that were male, and then other times they weren't. And there were certain biases that um, people had. So people tended to just think when they hear two females laughing together, they're more likely to say they're friends. Um, in fact, it's really striking. So here you see um, the, the response bias, so just the likelihood of saying friends, regardless of whether you get the right answer or not, when they hear two females. And every single culture has a difference, where they just all, everybody around the world, thinks that when you hear two females laughing together, that they're more likely to be friends than strangers. That's right. Yeah, all the, all the laughs come from a corpus of conversations that I recorded at UC Santa Cruz. And they're all times when people would laugh at the same time. And they were, on average, they were one second long. So these are very brief clips of people laughing at the same time, and they either knew each other or they didn't. And then, so everywhere around the world, they heard the exact same um, stimulus set and in the exact same condition where it was, it was computerized experiment where they wore headphones and, and even in, you know, out in Tanzania or in Kenya, they, the people would go out there and give them the experiment. Yeah, so um, we had people from all walks of life participate in this. Uh, of the laughers? Yeah, they're all, they're an 18 or 19 year old students at UC Santa Cruz. So, um, you know, you can imagine it's, you know, a pretty limited demographic. Um, but, I mean, that it makes it even more striking because these are people that are completely foreign to, I mean, if you go to uh, Tanzania to the Hadza people, uh, they've never, you know, I mean, they, they're, in, they, they have very low rates of encountering people like that. And so even they can do it really successfully. Or in New Guinea, we had people who, in uh, New Ireland, where, I mean, they, you can see pictures. Here are subjects, this is Karina Apicella, one of my col collaborators, and um, she works at the Hadza, and so this is the experimental context you see. Here is uh, in, in Papua New Guinea, where they would do the experiment with everybody around them. I think only she could hear it, but they're all fascinated by this. Um, Here's another lady in Papua New Guinea who's doing the experiment. So you can see these people are, um, they're, they're all doing the experiment the same way. Sometimes they had to have the instructions, the instructions are all translated in the experiment, but um, sometimes they, they had to be read to the participants and then the experimenter would enter the answer.
in this case, I was testing for whether or not people, so my idea is that laughter potentially in a group can signal something about the affiliation between the people that are laughing together. And so what I'm testing for is how sensitive are listeners in picking up the information about whether two people know each other. And it's in using a paradigm what we call thin slice, which is you take a very little bit of information. I mean, thin slice is usually thought to be like a minute or so. My thin slices are one second. In one second, can you get enough information to make an accurate judgment about whether people know each other? Definitely. That's right. Potentially, but, but, but what my data suggests is that if you played people recordings of those people laughing together, they'd be able to tell the difference between people that know each other and people that don't. And it comes down to some certain acoustic features. Um, laugh speed matters. So faster laughs, if people are laughing faster, which is probably correlated with the arousal that's associated with that emotional vocal system that's distinct from the speech system, they detect that. And so there are these acoustic features in the individual laughs that actually give it away. So even if people that don't know each other are laughing together and it feels authentic, it could actually still be different and detectable in one second to somebody in New Guinea. That's right. We can, you can control for that in the analysis, so you can actually transform the pitch values, by, you can normalize them, and then you can actually see what's the effect of pitch independent of whether it's, so it's not just that females have higher pitch voices, and so that, you can control that, that effect. Yeah, that's a good question. The laughers? Oh. <laughs> Did I mention that these were recorded at UC Santa Cruz? <laughs> That's a great question. I don't have data on that. My suspicion is that yes, for the most part, anywhere you go, the laugh. And I do have recordings of people laughing at the, the experiment, right? So people do this experiment, they're laughing along with it. And so, laughs sound like laughs, but there is one study about crying that it makes me think that there is something to um, cultural differences in laugh production. Babies in German cry more like German phonology than babies in fr France. They cry more like French. <laughs> it's true. And it, it has to do with the intonation contour in French and German have slightly different rise-fall patterns, and the baby cries from babies that are, you know, a couple months old or less have those particular intonation patterns already in their cries. Now, at a glance, they sound like babies crying. But if you do the acoustic analysis, they're a little bit different. So I bet that laughter also has some things um, that are variable depending on the language that they speak. And fake laugh would be even more, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so, all right, so just the final thing, why do we laugh? So one reason I think is that it's, we're signaling cooperative intent. When we're laughing with one another, we are giving some information that's similar to the function that you see in non-human primates and other mammals that do this play vocalization behavior, that they're, they're, they're communicating something about their intent to engage in future interactions in a positive way. And when humans laugh together, they're also engaging in these potentially um, positive signals that are helping you develop a relationship for later. And, and continuing to do it strengthens emotional connections, and that's why you laugh best with some of your oldest friends, and you're strengthening these bonds. Um, it's also, I think, a way to signal decryption of indirect language, and so you can actually you can, um, reveal that you have some information that is implied and then that helps you um, maybe then recognize who is in your group and who isn't in your group or who has certain information and who doesn't. Um, it also, I think, can signal an affiliation to overhearers. So when a group of people are laughing at the bar, you all know they're buddies, right? And then that might help you assess them as a group of people that you might have to deal with later, right? And that can also be something that is, you know, aggressive. So you have a bunch of guys are wanting to fight another group of guys, and they're all laughing, <laughs> you know? That could be intimidating because you're recognizing they have some connection and they're laughing about something, which is an honest signal that they're sharing information at some level. 
Um, it also is in conversational turn taking and coordination. So when pe I have other work showing that people that laugh more in conversation um, end up coordinating their speech rates more, which then um, is associated with a more greater likelihood to cooperate in a behavior economic game. So when people, when people are talking at the same speech rate, if they converge in their speech rate, then they're more likely to actually cooperate when you say, you know, here's the situation where you can give money or take money. And laughing is, plays a role in that. So I think there's an important role there. And finally, there's the, the evil side of it, which is social manipulation. People can try to laugh and try to in, you know, gain your trust. The car salesman, ah, you're so funny, right? And really what he's trying to do is make you trust him more. And then when it comes down to signing for the car, you're like, this guy likes, thinks I'm funny. Right. So people are we're manipulating each other, and that's the in the rule of animal signaling. That's what signals are. They are designed to manipulate the behavior of other organisms. That's the general definition of a signal, and laughter is no exception. We are manipulating one another. Sometimes it's for our own mutual benefit, and sometimes it's not. All right. So um, um, that is the end, and I think we're going to have time for questions. I just, but thank you for your attention. And here's my list of collaborators, and. Um, this was, this was good, and I, I like the questions, too.